بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيبي إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا Welcome to another session of Tafsir Surah Al-Fatiha. This is our third session. And we discussed in the previous sessions the importance of Tafsir of the Quran and the importance of Surah Al-Fatiha in itself. And we discussed that we need to seek the correct exegesis of the Qur'an, the correct interpretation of the Qur'an. There are hundreds of tafasir, hundreds of interpretations of the Qur'an out there. We have to be very careful that we do not fall in the trap of tafsir bil-ra'i, opinion-based tafsir. So this is something that we discussed. And we discussed the virtues of Surah Al-Fatiha, how it's a very important surah in the Qur'an. It's the first surah. It's the surah that is recited in every single prayer and it's recited twice in every prayer. This is why it's called Al-Mathani because it's recited twice. We discussed that Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is a part of Surah Al-Fatiha. This is something that there's consensus about between the Sunnis and the Shias. And the Shia opinion goes further and it says that it's a part of every other surah, every other surah in the Quran. And the proof of that are two verses in the Qur'an. One is chapter 96, verse 1. And that's the first verse that came down in the Qur'an. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Rasulullah, Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Read in the name of your Lord who created. So every time you read the Qur'an, you have to say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Because the order, it's a direct order. Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Read in the name of your Lord. This is one. Second is chapter 15, verse 87. We have given you the seven Mathani and the Quran. Now, if you take Surah Al Fatiha and you take out the Bismillah Rahman Rahim, it's going to be six verses. So, seven, it, it makes it, including when we include the Bismillah Rahman Rahim, it makes it seven. Now, of course, we have many ahadith, many narrations about the reward of saying Bismillah. Say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim before you do anything. In a hadith, a man came to Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib and he tells him, I have stomach pain. So the Imam alayhi salam tells him, you recite Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim before you eat and the pain of your stomach will go away. So the man came back later and he said i still have stomach pain i said bismillah rahman rahim before i eat and i still have stomach pain so amir al-mu'minin tells him to say bismillah rahman rahim for every bite that he takes this is something that we have to try to remind ourselves even though it's difficult to remind ourselves that but um we have to try to make it a habit to always say bismillah rahman rahim and it's the best way to start any action when you're eating, when you're driving, whatever you're doing, you begin with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So now, inshallah, we're going to do the tafsir today, inshallah, tonight, of Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, this very important verse in the Qur'an that is repeated 114 times in the Qur'an. So, as we said, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is a part of the Qur'an. It's a part of the recitation. And our fuqaha, our scholars say that if someone began by reciting Surah Al-Fatiha or any other surah in the, in the salah and they took out Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, then there's a problem with their salah. Because we need to recite Al-Fatiha and another surah. And to make sure that you have recited a full surah, you have to add Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim to it. Now, with regards to the development of the Basmala in the writing, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, as we know, he wasn't just a prophet who was teaching people to pray and to fast and to go to Hajj. No, Rasulullah was building the state. Rasulullah was the head of state. He was the head of the military. And therefore, Rasulullah would have to write letters sometimes. So he would make uh, peace agreements. He would write letters to... He would send emissaries. He would write letters. So 
he would begin his letters with a type of remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It, over time, it developed into saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the pre-Islamic Arabia, the term that the Arabs would use, and the Mushrikeen as well, they would write Bismikallahum. Bismikallahum, it means in the name of you, O God. Ya Allah. Allahum means Ya Allah. In the name of you, Ya Allah, basically. Well, as we will come to explain, inshallah, that the Mushrikeen, the idol worshippers, the polytheists, they did believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but in addition to believing in Allah, they believed in many other idols. And they know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is great, but they would use those idols in order to bring them closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they did acknowledge Allah. The society that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi was delivering the religion of Islam to were not atheists. In fact, when you look at the Quran, you see that the Quran does not even talk about atheists because the Quran it moved past that idea where some people someone's going to totally reject Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There were people ever since the beginning of time who were believing in a creator, believing in someone, a power that has created everything. Over time, people started worshipping the sun and the moon and the stars and other creation here and there in order to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the mushrikeen, they used to say Bismillahum, and this was the known basmala, the known start of any action, especially letters, especially in writing, within the Arab Ar Arabian Peninsula at that time. Now, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he moved on to say Bismillah. He moved on to say Bismillah, only this, these two words, Bismillah, after chapter 11, verse 41 was revealed. And that is Bismillah majraha wa mursaha. After that was revealed, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he started in his letters writing Bismillah, and then he would write his letters. Then there was another development. Chapter 17, verse 110 was revealed. Allah says in the Quran, قُلْ إِدْعُوا اللَّهَ أَوْ إِدْعُوا الرَّحْمَانِ أَيَّمْ مَا تَدْعُوا فَلَهُ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَى Call upon Allah or call upon the Rahman. The Rahman is one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are names of Allah that are exclusively to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are amongst the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which can be used for other people. For example, Rahman and Rahim. Rahman is like Allah. You can't name your son Rahman, but you can name your son Rahim. Rahman is a name that is exclusively to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's like Allah. Allah is a name that is exclusively to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, to say, to give another name, al Musawir, Qawi, or any, any of the other names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, some of the other names, you are allowed to use them. So once this verse came, Rasulullah began to say Bismillah ar-Rahman. So he added, in addition to the Bismillah, he added Bismillah ar-Rahman. Then finally, when chapter 27, verse 30, and this is Surah Al-Naml, this is the only instance where two Bismillahs are mentioned in the Quran, in, in the story of Prophet Sulaiman, when he sent a letter to the, uh, the Bilqis, the Queen of Sheba. So he, um, he sent her a letter and she saw the letter and she says, Innahu min Sulaiman wa innahu bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Sulaiman wrote a letter to her, to the Queen, and he writes to her, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the beginning of that. So after this was revealed, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he began to write Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim in his letters as well. So this is regarding the development of the Basmala through the writing of Rasulullah and the letters of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Now, as we know, there was an opposition to the Basmala by the Mushrikeen. The Mushrikeen, they do believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but they don't accept that Allah is Rahman, Rahim. These qualities, they reject them. They, it is narrated that when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi was writing the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, 
with the mushrikeen of Mecca. This was the treaty that the, the Muslims wrote with the kuffar after Rasulullah tried to enter into Mecca. They didn't allow him. They wrote a treaty. Then the next year, the Prophet came and he performed the Umrah. So they were writing the treaty and Rasulullah, he tells, uh, he tells Amir al-Mu'mineen to write and the, one of, the head of the mushrikeen by the name of Suhail ibn Amr, he was there. Rasulullah said, write Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Suhail ibn Amr says, wait, I know Allah. But Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, I don't accept that. So the Muslims, they wrote on that treaty, Bismik Allahum, in the name of you, Ya Allah, in the name of Allahum. So this was the opposition towards the Basmala that began during the days of Jahiliyyah uh, from the Mushrikeen. And you see that there's an opposition to the Basmala until today, during the time of Uthman. So during the time of Rasulullah, it was recited in every prayer. And it was what Muslims would differentiate between the end of a surah and a big, and the start of another surah was the Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Sometimes they wouldn't know Rasulullah is reciting the Quran. Then when he says Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, they would know that that surah came to an end. Another surah began. So this was what the way that the Muslims would differentiate between the surahs and the Quran. Now, over time, during the time of Uthman, some Muslims, they came and they said, this is not the basmala is not a part of the of the surah but it's something just to as a divider between the surahs and the quran however rasulullah did recite it abu Bakr recited it um umar recited it and amir al-mu'mineen and the imams of the ahl bayt recited it but this was a bid'ah that was started during the time of uthman which he took out the basmala this is why within the sunnis today there's difference in opinion some of them the malikis when they begin when they begin their salah, they begin Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. But you find others, especially with the Wahhabis, they don't recite the Basmalah in the prayer. Or if they recite it, they recite it in a very soft voice, which is, um, they separate it from the surah. So now we go to the exegesis, the tafsir of Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. It is said that Ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Abbas, the cousin of Amir al-Mu'mineen, the cousin of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he's known as Habr al-Ummah because he's written so much and he's uh, narrated so many ahadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And he was one of the early scholars from uh, the early scholars of Islam and one of the mufassireen of the Quran that is his views. He is, in fact, there is only a few people who are accepted by the Sunnis and the Shias. Abdullah ibn Abbas is one of them. He's accepted by the Shias and the Sunnis, his opinions. And this is because his tafsir, he says that any tafsir of the Quran that I took, I took it from Ali ibn Abi Talib. Meaning that he didn't bring his own opinion. He didn't come and include his own opinion when he was doing tafsir of the Quran. He was taking his knowledge, taking his knowledge from Amir al Mu'minin. So he says, I came to Amir al Mu'minin and I tell him to begin the tafsir of Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. This verse that we recite every day. He says, Amir al-Mu'mineen began to explain Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim from, from uh, sunset all the way until sunrise, until dawn. He was explaining it to me. And throughout the whole night, he was explaining to me, he had only, he had not even finished the ba of Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The ba, the first ba of Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Amir al-Mu'minin had not completed it. So today, we're not going to take that long. We're just going to explain it very shortly. And what is the ba? Ba, it's, a, it's what is referred to as a harf jar, a preposition. Harf jar, a preposition, is a word or set of words that indicates location in, near, beside, on top of. These are examples of a, a preposition. So you can't come and say in without saying in what? Beside, beside what? You need, to, you need to give it a meaning. There needs to be a muta'allaq. There needs to be something that is attached to the harf al-jar to give it meaning. Because it's something that is in relationship to a noun or a pronoun, and it gives meaning to the noun and to the pronoun, and it gives meaning to the sentence. So to just say ba by itself, this is called harf jar. Harf jar requires a muta'allaq. 
So what is the muta'allaq of the, of the ba of Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim? What is it attached to? You're saying in the name of Allah. What in the name of Allah? So here, scholars, they say muta'allaq, harf al-jar, fi'l mahdhuf, a verb that is not mentioned in the statement. Mahdhuf, what is that? Qawluka asta'een bismillah. So it's as if you're saying, I seek refuge in the name of Allah. I seek refuge, bismillah. Asta'inu bismillah. So this is what um, some scholars say, the meaning of the ba of bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. It's as if you're saying, asta'in. I seek refuge, but you're not saying it. It's mahdhuf. It's not mentioned, but then when you say bismillah, it's as if you're saying, I seek refuge in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now there's one question some scholars say. Do we seek refuge in the name of Allah or do we seek refuge in Allah himself? This is an important question. Is the name the same as the essence? Asta'inu bismillah or asta'inu billah? We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Fatiha, which we will come to, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدْ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ You, Allah, we worship and you we seek refuge to. So here, different scholars, they say, who are we actually seeking refuge in? Are we seeking refuge in the name or are we seeking refuge in Allah? The Shi'i opinion regarding this is that the name is not the same as the essence. The name is not exactly the same as the essence. The name is the marker which introduces us, which leads us to the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's not the same as the essence. So this is one one meaning of the ba, one opinion, one set of scholars, they say ba is muta'allaq harf al-jar fi'l mahdhuf qawluka asta'in. When you say asta'in wa bismillah, I seek refuge, but you're not saying it. Another opinion is muta'allaq bi fi'lin fi qalbik. It's, it's attached, the ba is attached to um, action that is not, asta not necessarily only asta'in, but it's anything that comes in your mind. For example, you want to take a cup of water and you want to drink, you say, I drink in the name of Allah. When you say Bismillah, you're saying, I'm doing this in the name of Allah. When you want to eat, you say, I eat in the name of Allah. When you want to drive, you say, I drive in the name of Allah. Whatever you do, whatever fi nafsik, in your heart, in your mind, whatever you have in your mind, when you say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, you're saying that ba is is, is attached to that action that is in your mind, in your heart. So this is why they say that Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is a part of the surah. This, they say, when you say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. This basmala is to begin saying the surah al-Ham. In the name of Allah, I praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Qul huwa Allahu ahad. In the name of Allah, we say God is one. So this is in whatever action that you want to carry out, you have that in your mind. You know what you're going to do. You say the Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim as a intro, as a uh, prerequisite of that action. So this is regarding the ba of Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim to summarize, to summarize it for you. Now we go to the Arabic roots of the word ism because Bismillah. In the name of Allah. So what does ism mean? Name, it's scholars, they say that it's, um, it has two possible or other opinions, but these are the ones that stand out. Ism, they say, is derived from wasm. What does wasm mean? Wasm means a marker or a sign or a alama, uh, uh, a sign that leads you to something, alama. Um, or they, before they used to have a sign, a marker on the camel, on the sheep, on the animal, they would call it wasm al ibil, the, the uh, stamp that they put on the animal, that's called wasm al ibil. So it's a name, wasm is, is a marker. So it's a name basically which distinguishes people apart from one another. So this is what wasm is. Wasm, they say that ism. Ism means name. It's derived from the word wasm, which is a marker which dis distinguishes people from one another. So if you have sons, you name one of your sons Ali, another one Hassan, and another one Hussein. 
in order to call one of your sons, you have to give them a marker. You, you don't say, my son, come here. How are they going to know which one you're calling? So you say, Ali, come here. Hassan, come here. Hussein, come here. Once you're giving them that marker, that is the wasm. That is the marker that you're placing on them. And that is how, that's how you're going to differentiate them from anyone else. So they say, ism is derived from wasm. Another opinion, and this is the opinion of Ayatollah Sayyid Khoi, the Grand Marja, uh, he says that what ism is not derived from was marker. It's derived from sumu. Sumu means highness. Today, when when they call the kings or the 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 um, princes, they say sumu al malik, sumu al amir, your highness. The, the sumu means the highness, the highness, and this is why sama, the sky, it's called sama because it's high. So this is the opinion of Ayatollah Khoi. He says ism is derived from sumu because Allah's name is the most high. So we begin in the name of the most high. So anyways, whichever one you accept, whichever one is accepted, these are all theories, scholars. They say ism is the marker. It's the wasm or the alama or the ulu or the high rank, which directs us to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's something that leads us to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then we say bism. Allah, Bismillah. Now, we're going to talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But before that, there are 99 names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah says in the Quran, وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَى فَدْعُوهُ بِهَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the great names, the beautiful names. Call him by these things. These names, they all have their own significance. So scholars say, for example, and these are from hadith, if you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to answer you, to give you something, you say, Ya Allah, 10 times, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will answer you. Allah will say, Labbayka abdi. If you are in desperate need of something, you say, Ya Rab, three times. If you're in need of rizq, of sustenance, you say, Ya Razzaq, 70 times. Each one of those names leads you to one of the qualities and characteristics of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's beautiful for you to take one day, one hour out of your day or one day out of the year to sit and contemplate regarding these names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Razzaq. What does Razzaq mean? Our whole life we're running after rizq from this person and that person. But the true Razzaq, in Allah huwa razzaq dhul quwwat al -mateen. The true rizq, sustenance comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So take these names, and this is a you know a less a habit or something that we should we should um, try to work on. For uh, for you know to try to take a name and try to contemplate that name, to try to stay say that name as much as you can. Try to remember Allah Subhanahu wa Taala by those names. So this uh, these are the names of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. But then the greatest of those names is Allah. And Allah is the universal name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So all of these 99 names of Allah, all of the 99 names of Allah, you put them together, they equal Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah is not one of the names of Allah. Allah is the name that sums up, that if you sum up all of the names of Allah and you want to take one meaning, then you will come up, then you will say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah means God. God, the omnipotent, the one who has unlimited power, the omniscient, the one who has unlimited knowledge, the omnipresent, the one who is everywhere. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is God. Allah is God. Today, some people, some of these Islamophobes, they say these Muslims, they worship Allah. And they think that Allah is another God that is different from God. God is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. God is Allah. Allah is God with the capital G. So when we say we worship God, we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, so it's not only the Muslims that worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The, the Arab Christians, they say we pray to Allah. That is God. The Jews who pray to God, they say we worship Allah, the Arabs of, of them. Any Arab, in order to say God with the capital G, they would say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah. 
So Allah is the name that gathers up and defines all of the other names. So you take the Razak, the Musawwar, whatever name you take, you bring them together, and that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, as we mentioned earlier, the pagans, the mushrikeen, they did acknowledge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they did believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, they were mushriks, they were idol worshippers, they were polytheists. They believed that there are intermediaries that bring them closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in chapter 39, verse 3, Allah says in the Quran, وَالَّذِينَ اتَّخَذُوا مِن دُونِهِ أَوْلِيَاءَ مَا نَعْبُدُهُمْ إِلَّا لِيُقَرِّبُونَ إِلَى اللَّهِ زُلْفَ They say we worship these idols, so they bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they did acknowledge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They did believe in Allah, but they believed in idols. So in another verse, Allah says in the Quran, وَلَئِنْ سَأَلْتَهُمْ Chapter 39, verse 38, وَلَئِنْ سَأَلْتَهُمْ مَنْ خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ لَيَقُولُنَّ اللَّهِ You ask them who created the skies and the earth, they will say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, because over time they were attached to these idols and the idols became a form of business, a form of business for them. But the, there were some families in, in Mecca who would, people would come to Mecca, and Mecca was in, uh, the city of monotheism. Abraham, Ibrahim built the Kaaba, and he called people to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But over time, they started introducing idols. And this was, um, some people, it was a business, because people come to perform Hajj in Mecca. Hajj existed even before Islam. They would come, and they would tell them, in order for your prayers to be answered, you have to worship this God, the God of the sun, the God of the moon, the God of this and that, the God that will give you sustenance. And these desperate people, they would go and they would buy these gods, and they would worship them, and the business people, they would make money off of these people. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you don't need an intermediary. You could call upon me at any time, in the, during the day, at night, when you're alone, Wherever you are, you can call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah will listen to you. Allah will be there for you. Allah can hear you. But they, over time, they became so attached to these idols that it became so difficult for them to say the name of Allah by himself. This is why Allah says in chapter 39, verse 45, وَإِذَا ذُكِرَ الَّذِينَ مِن دُونِهِ إِذَا هُمْ يَسْتَبْشِرُونَ When the name of Allah is mentioned alone, إِشْمَأَزَّتْ قُلُوبُ الَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْآخِرَةِ They would get very angry, they would get very upset when Allah is mentioned alone. But when, when they would add the idols in addition to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they would be happy. And this is shirk, this is idol worship, and this is the... The, all of the prophets, all of the prophets, 124,000 prophets, they came to tell people to worship the one and only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, we go on to the final part of the Basmala, and that is Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. The mercy giving, the merciful, or the gracious, the merciful. There are many ways to define this, the Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. But if we want to look at it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Basmala, out of the 99 names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah uses two very important qualities. And they're very similar to one another. Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim. They're both from the same word, from the same root of mercy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants everyone who reads the Quran, everyone who reads all of the chapters in the Quran, except one chapter, and that is Surah At-Tawbah, chapter 9 of the Qur'an, to begin with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. To be reminded of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the merciful nature of Islam and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah, He is Arham ar rahimin Now Allah could have told us to begin Bismillah, you know, one of the other names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bismillah. Shadid al-Aqab, Sari' al-Aqab, many, many other names you could use to describe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want, Allah wants us to begin 
by remembering him, Bismillah, God, in the name of Allah, who is he? Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim. Because mercy is the most profound quality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has many other qualities. Allah is also the Adil, he's the Jabbar, he's the Mutakabbir, he's the Khaliq, he's the Raziq, he's, he's everything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has many other qualities and names, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to remember him through his mercy. This shows that Islam is a merciful religion, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is inviting us to his mercy. When you read the Quran, you will understand that the Quran is a book of mercy, a book of love, a book of compassion. And this word, Rahmah, is repeated many times in the Quran. It's one of the most important themes in the Quran, the theme of Rahmah, the theme of mercy. Out of the 99 names, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses this one to describe himself, to describe himself through his mercy. Now, Mercy, what is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? In a hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he says, Inna Allah ta'ala khalaqa mi'ata rahmah yawma khalaqa samawati wal ard. The day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the universe and the skies and the universe and the earth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala designated 100 mercies and created 100 types of mercy. إِنَّ اللَّهَ تَعَالَىٰ خَلَقَ مِئَةَ رَحْمَةِ يَوْمَ خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ كُلُّ رَحْمَةِ مِنْهَا طِبَاقْ مَا بَيْنَ السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ Each one of those mercy is as great as all of the mercy that you see in, in this life. Between the earth and the skies, all of that filled with mercy, this is all the mercy of Allah. Each one of those is that large. Then Allah, then the hadith says, فَأَهْبَطَ رَحْمَةِ مِنْهَا إِلَى الْأَرْضِ out of the 100 mercies that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created, He only brought down one mercy to this life that we live in. And then Rasulullah says, فَبِهَا تَرَاحَمُ الْخَلْقُ وَبِهَا تَعْطُفُ الْوَالِدَ عَلَى وَلَدِهَا وَبِهَا تَشْرَبُ الطَّيِّرُ وَالْوُحُوشُ مِنَ الْمَاءِ وَبِهَا تَعِيشُ الْخَلَائِرُ We need mercy to live. In this life, there is mercy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has played, placed mercy in the mother towards her child, the parents towards the children, and the animals, even the animals, you see that the mother takes care of the, her offspring, her, her children, and all of this mercy that you see in this life, you see a lot of mercy, we see a lot of mercy in this life, all of that is one portion of the mercy that was brought down. So he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created 100 and he only brought down one in this life. And in that one mercy, that's the mercy that's in the hearts of the people. You know, the hearts of the Muslim, the non-Muslim, the atheist, whoever it may be, the animals, whatever, any type of mercy that you see out there, that is from that one mercy. And that is what allows life to continue. Now, the, uh, in another hadith, we understand that this one mercy has been allocated in this life. Then there is 99, the 99 that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created. Where are they going to be? The hadith says that those are going to be on the day of judgment. The day of judgment, the mu'mineen, the believers, everyone will see such great mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where everyone will think that they will be saved. Everyone will have hope that they will be saved. The hadith says that even Iblis, even Shaitan, when he sees so many people are being saved, so many people are receiving the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Shaitan, Iblis is going to think and assume that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to be merciful with him as well. So that 99 mercy the 99% of the mercy has been allocated for the afterlife. Now, what is Ar-Rahman and what is Ar-Rahim? Ar-Rahman, scholars say, this is the mercy that goes for everyone. The Muslim, the non-Muslim, the animal, the whatever it may be, any type of creation, the plants, anything in this creation receives mercy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَرَحْمَتِي وَسِعَتْ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ 
every living being, every creation, anything that exists, anything that's a shape, anything that's a thing that exists, has received the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in one way or another. Whether we realize it, whether we don't realize it, everything has received the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That mercy is the Rahman. That is from the Rahman. So the Rahman, that mercy goes to everyone. And then, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Who does the Rahim go to? Here, according to the Quran and according to the Hadith, Rahim is the exclusive mercy to the Mu'mineen. The exclusive mercy to the believers. And Allah says in the Quran, وَكَانَ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَحِيمًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Rahim towards the Mu'mineen, towards the believers. So, if someone took the mercy of the Rahman in this life, and they took it in this life and they accepted it, then that Rahman mercy will lead them to the Rahim mercy. It will lead them to the mercy that brings them to faith. Because the Rahman, it means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent prophets, sent messengers, sent imams, sent books. Why? To guide people. This is because Allah is Rahman. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not just going to take a group of people to paradise and leave other people to suffer. No, Allah is just, Allah is adil, Allah is merciful, Allah is Rahman. Therefore, he sent prophets. And many of those prophets, they were harassed, they were abused, they were killed. Because people, they shut the door of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, the ones who shut the door of the mercy, they did not receive the mercy of the Rahim, which is exclusive to the believers. But those who accepted the mercy of the Rahman, and they were thankful for it, then they receive the mercy of the Rahim. And therefore, they receive the, that exclusive mercy. They're allowed to enter into that door and receive the extra mercy that is uh, exclusively for the believers on the Day of Judgment. So this is the Basmala, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This is the tafsir of the Basmala. And inshallah, in the next session, we're going to begin with Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Begin with the tafsir of Surah Al-Fatiha and begin by what does it mean to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What's the difference between hamd and shukr? And uh, we're going to talk about that. But now, alhamdulillah, we're done with the Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This is a very important verse in the Quran. It's a verse that we should begin every action with. Inshallah, here we will stop and we will continue in the next session with 